Well, hello and welcome everyone. It is now 3 p.m. and live from Brussels, it is our pleasure uh, from the side of BILK, the European Consumer Organization, uh, to present uh, another of our former Twitter, now X spaces, uh, on a very interesting discussion for today that we have planned uh, for you. And uh, we will be having a discussion on a very important topic, which is now uh, on everyone's word in Brussels, on the issue of cybersecurity. Um, as we have come to realize, uh, sometimes more interesting, sometimes more tragically, cybersecurity has become a very important topic which affects pretty much the lives of uh, everyone as the explosion of connected devices has led to pretty much everything we use on a daily basis being intrinsically connected to the internet and basically sharing and communicating every day that we could possibly even fathom or imagine. This, of course, represents increasing risks, and uh, this is the issue that we will be tackling today, uh, which is how to address them and how can EU legislation react accordingly. But before we go on to that, let me just go with some uh, house rules. So welcoming all participants to this discussion, I would like to already set out for you what will be the guidelines for today. Uh, so we will have three brilliant speakers joining us um, with some very interesting insights on this topic. Uh, and afterwards, you will also, of course, as participants, have the opportunity to ask your questions. So how will that come about? Well, after um, which I have no doubt will be very interesting presentations, we will have a Q&A session in which, uh, through this platform, you can ask questions to our speakers. To do so, all you need to do is to take the floor. Uh, you might do so in writing. You might just writing. Uh, to do so in writing, you might have noticed that there is a, a bubble sign just on the right-hand side of your screen, just below the participants' pictures. If you can click on that, you can type in your questions. Also, you can literally take the floor and uh, speak. Uh, and to do so, uh, you might also uh, you might also do it in the sense that. Uh, your registration will be noted, but um, please do understand that due to time constraints, we might not be able to take all questions that we would like to. So if you can type it, that will be much appreciated because the discussion will last sensibly 45 minutes. So uh, we beg you for your briefness and powers of being concise. A recording will also be available at the end of this uh, of this discussion on the book account, and you can pretty much just use the same link you used to log into the discussion today. So that said, I hope everything is clear. Should it not be, please feel free to type. I would uh, go on to basically introduce our speakers. So today we will have two representatives of consumer organizations, which are BILK members, to present uh, on some of the fantastic work they have been doing over the past years. Uh, first off, we will have uh, Andrew Lochlin from Which, uh, the UK consumer group uh, and Bilk member. Uh, hello, Andy. Hope you're uh, hope you're okay and listening. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have Els Brugeman from uh, Testa Shot Test Ankoop, um, Belgian consumer group, uh, also Bilk member. Hello, Els. Hi, Claudia. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. And also together with us will be Christian Bulumak, uh, policy advisor for the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament and currently very much engaged in the negotiations of the Cyber Resilience Act. Hello, Christian. Hello, Claudia. Hello, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us on this uh, very shiny, sunny Brussels afternoon. And moving on uh, with our agenda. So we will now proceed with uh, our speakers. They will both have sensibly around five, six minutes to uh, give us a brief intervention. And afterwards, we'll be happy to take on questions as they come. So without um, without further ado, I would just ask Andrew, uh, if you would like to take the floor, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Um, hello, everybody. Um, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for listening to me today. Um, so I work for Witch in the Product Testing Department, and um, I've been at Witch for about ten years, and um, we've been actually looking at uh, security of connected products for about that much time. Um, and um, it really was when I arrived, um, sort of at Witch, I saw we were incredibly strong in the fields of traditional product testing, uh, ergonomics, energy use, uh, and so on. But there was actually this gathering storm on the horizon, <clears throat> which was everything being networked, everything being connected to the internet or, or, or a network in some description. Um, and that actually posed huge challenges, as we all know, that are now starting to vest, not only because consumers' privacy, security, but also on a wider basis to their consumer rights and also to, um, to, to well, specifically to sustainability and the environment. Um, so we attacked this uh, problem in three kind of key ways. Um, first of all, was to um, run investigations um, uh, and raise awareness of the issue. Um, things like the hackable home, which I won't talk too much about because I know that uh, my Belgian uh, colleague was, is, uh, is going to cover that. We also built a, um, a test program, a testing strategy. So in the absence of regulation and even standards um, uh, five or six years ago, um, we built a test program to start routinely assessing these products for these cybersecurity standards, which were just not quite in place, although now they're starting to come to market um, in both um, the EU and UK. And finally, um, we also did um, a, a, a program of campaigning and lobbying because it's all very well taking action on a sort of fairly individual basis as a consumer organization. But what you really need is a bedrock of regulation, as we know, uh, and a set of rules that start stipulating and, and start moving the more um, looser ends of the market practice out of the, uh, the picture. So that obviously culminated in uh, the end of last year in the UK uh, with the Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Act. Um, and I know that obviously we're going to talk some about the Cyber Resilience Act that's in, going on in the EU as well today. But one of the key pillars of that legislation is something that we pushed for uh, very heavily and felt was really, really important. And that is a um, commitment, well, not actually a legal requirement now, for manufacturers of smart products to be transparent with users uh, at the point of purchase, um, or rather when, when they're kind of um, looking at these products, for how long they will support those products with software updates. Now, this seems like a fairly sort of minor thing to a certain extent, but actually it's incredibly important because it shows uh, that a manufacturer has understood their responsibilities when producing smart products, understood the full product life cycle from, from inception to sunsetting, uh, and understands how if a, if a security vulnerability emerges in, say, year one how uh, or, or year 10, you've got a plan to fix that and a commitment to the consumer. Um, so that's coming into force next April. But on, in the meantime, we've been pushing manufacturers to not only come clean about the policies they've got, and sadly, still only around 50% in our surveys do, um, uh, but also try and commit products for as long as possible. Because the real nightmare in this is hackable products, as, as we're about to hear, and cybersecurity and data privacy risk. But it's also, being completely honest, good appliances being taken to landfill before they before they really should be. And that's the problem when you start networking and adding software and, 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 and services onto these traditional appliances. Suddenly, it accelerates their obsolescence. And that's the nightmare that we really, really can't have happen for many, many different reasons. So that's kind of the uh, the big things that we've been doing. Um, and also we'll have a big report coming at the end of the year on our latest software updates um, survey, which is um, getting manufacturer policies in place. So very keen to um, uh, hear thoughts and, and get feedback when we push that out. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that very uh, comprehensive um, presentation. Uh, really fascinating work uh, you guys are doing. Um, and now, on, on that note, uh, I jump into in another um, push when it comes to product testing of um, vulnerable, hackable consumer products, and that is Els Brueggemann, uh, who will now present us a bit more about uh, one of the key campaigns that have made part of our, of, of our buzz when it comes to the issue of hackable devices, uh, the Hackable Home Campaign. Gender centers have some recent uh, developments recently. So, Els, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Claudio, and, and thank you for giving us indeed the opportunity to, to share some of our insights. Um, I would like to echo what also Andy was saying, that uh, cybersecurity also for us as a Belgian organization is an absolute uh, priority. Um, you see, at, at Testasha, Testan Group, uh, we always start from science, uh, very much like which uh, we actually started as a testing organization. So it's really in our DNA, uh, and it's still one of our core activities because these results are the science that backs up the advice that we give to consumers, but we also publish the test results to reveal systemic problems and, and push for more better regulation, enforcement and standards. And that's exactly the case here. So while indeed in the 60s we might be testing a traditional washing machine, nowadays we're also more and more testing connected devices because they're already in our homes and there will be there even more of them uh, tomorrow. And they have a great potential around the home, you know, bringing new functions and features to products we use every day, having a smoother consumer experience. But while um, consumers are aware that when they connect their laptop to the internet, it comes with risks, they don't always have the same perception when it comes to smart devices. So we thought, what better way to test this than fill up, filling up a home uh, full of connected devices and asking some ethical hackers to, you, to check how safe they truly are. And this is basically how the Hackable Home Project was born. We first did it in 2018. We basically here at Testa Show, we stuffed up the home of a colleague full of uh, connected devices and uh, to see, uh, to check how they stand up against attacks. Uh, the attacks. And since then we have, have enlarged also the, to other countries in Italy, Spain and Portugal with additional tests in 2021 and 23. Um, and since then, a broad range of products have passed the review, um, going from smart watches, tablets, smart door locks, doorbells, uh, garage door openers, security cameras, smart alarms, thermostats, vacuum cleaners, kitchen robots, baby phones, even a smart sex toy, you name it, and probably it has popped up in one of the tests. And each and every time we try to compromise these uh, devices uh, in different kinds of uh, settings and locations. So over the internet, but also with local access and even with limited physical access. And each and every time we try to set up a mix of both, you know, the more expensive ones um, uh, from reputable brands and the less expensive ones, the cheaper ones of unknown brands. And each and every time, and I really don't say this with pleasure, but each and every time, uh, a whole bunch of vulnerabilities uh, popped up, very often severely high ones or critical ones. I really don't want to bother you or bore you with many numbers, uh, but please allow me to have a very quick overview of what we did over the years. 2018, we tested 19 products and at least half of them, it was problematic. 2021, 16 connected devices tested and no less than 54 vulnerabilities were detected. And what's make it, what makes it even more worrisome is that in 62%, so 10 out of the 16 products that we tested, they had a critical or a severely high security flaw. And then 2023, we thought five years later, it's a jubilee, let's have a celebration, let's have a look, what is the state of play? Where are we after these five years of testing? But unfortunately, we, we didn't manage to pop up champagne bottles, but because here again, 16 smart home devices were tested and again, 60 vulnerabilities were detected. We had, for example, a Wi-Fi router where there was a flaw in the protocol which allowed the devices to find each other and connect to each other. So if you had access to this insecure Wi-Fi, uh, then a Wi-Fi router, then you could basically take over all of the all of the of the devices even maybe more worrisome there was an example of a, a wireless outdoor camera which had no less than 12 vulnerabilities three of them very critical so it was really easy for us to install malware um, and steal secure information or intercept uh, video footage and there's the example of uh, a, a baby monitor that was actually sending the images of the baby to a server that was not secure. And even more, 
via this server, you could send instructions to the baby monitor not to send the images to the server again, but directly to the hacker. And these are just a few examples from the last test. Before we had tests where we had, for example, um, uh, a children's tablet where we would we were able to actually overtake it and have actually a conversation with the child. Just to say, um, five years later, it makes you wonder where exactly are we? And I have to admit that five years later, we the reality is that consumers still very much live in a hackable home and that five years of hackable home testing has turned out to be five years um, of standstill or just with little improvements. Consumers are still very vulnerable to hacks into their personal data because these devices are collecting personal data from consumers. But also it is a way in to launch a wider uh, network attack, which really shows the tentacles of you know, insecure consumer IoT. And it's not just a thing about expensive devices versus the cheaper ones. Um, yes, it is true. We tend to find more security flaws in the cheaper ones, but believe me, the more expensive ones are not off the hook either. It was, for example, very striking to us to see that some rather expensive devices that were out of support, so they were not getting software updates anymore, they were still on sale. And we need to take into account that consumers might tend to hold on to the to at least for sure, the, 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 the more expensive devices a bit longer. And so they are also holding on to devices that don't have software updates anymore. So as a consumer organization, we can of course give tips and tricks to consumers to be safer, you know, uh, make sure you have a strong password, uh, use uh, two-step verification, uh, do your updates. But at the end of the story, at the end of the line, the reality is that the results have not improved over five years. And unfortunately, also the reality is that there is a stubborn refusal among some manufacturers, at least, to be serious about cybersecurity. And um, well, needless to say that uh, with everything coming up at EU level, the Cyber Resilience Act, uh, amongst others, uh, this is very welcome and highly anticipated. And uh, I have to say expectations are high. Well, thank you very much, Els. Indeed, very, very, very uh, serious issue on, on the point and still a lot uh, thought that remains to be done. Um, that takes me then to my next speaker. Um, and on this, it's a very, very good opportunity that we have here today um, to shine a light on a, on a procedure that normally um, all, all of us would like to be uh, having some more transparency and more discussion on what is actually going on. So it's it's always very important to see that uh, we have opportunities to to have some uh, expert input uh, when we're undergoing trial org negotiations with an important file uh, like the Cyber Resilience Act, which is indeed the file that uh, stands to definitely address some of the issues that we've been discussing. Um, and have been pointed out by Andrew and Els uh, when it comes to connected devices and in particular to the necessity of further consumer protection in connected devices. So I'm very happy to have with us here today Christian Bulumak. Uh, Christian is a Green ZFA policy advisor at the European Parliament and is directing agencies negotiations. So uh, Christian, very curious to hear your perspective on uh, not just the initial proposal, um, but also the position uh, uh, of the parliament, which is, uh, for Bill, has been recognized more ambitious, more ambitious stance. And also, of course, what you can tell us um, uh, on the current state of the, of the negotiations so far. So very interesting to hear your perspective on this, Christian. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello again. So um, let's do, as you did, uh, some house rules in the beginning, some housekeeping. Um, and I will go a few steps back to the procedure. Um, as you know, in the European Union, the European Commission is the one making proposals for various regulations, directives, and several other types of legislative acts. Uh, then the proposal is being forwarded to the Parliament and the Council, who will also uh, create their own views or amendments to those proposals. Uh, and in the end, uh, the two co-legislators, the Council and the Parliament, will meet and they will uh, negotiate the final result. This is the stage where we are now. Um, 
with a commission acting as an honest broker as they are the ones who proposed originally the prop um, text. So uh, first a disclaimer, the official positions of each three institutions are the ones which are approved. Um, for the parliament is the uh, ITRE committee who has approved the parliament negotiation mandates. The commission proposal you, you all have seen, the parliament one is available on the website uh, and the council also has, has a position. So um, the short lesson in um, European treaties is over. Now let's go back to the topic. And um, I have to mention that eight years ago, it was the first time when a member of the Green CFA group in the European Parliament has proposed the list of requirements for connected products. It was before the Cybersecurity Act, which was approved in 2018. And we were saying things like every device has to have a password, every device uh, has to have updates and patches whenever a vulnerability is being disclosed. It took us many years to, to reach the stage of uh, having a proposal on the table, although we table it in probably every cybersecurity related file. But now we have the Cyber Resilience Act and uh, I think it's a very good step forward. As the previous speakers have described, uh, it was a wild west. Everybody was doing whatever they wanted. Some products were somewhat secured other products were totally unsecured, and worst case, uh, it was impossible to secure them. If they were built without basic security features, you could not add them. You could not uh, add a password or change a password since there was no option for that. Um, but now we have the CRA, um, and let's see uh, what's happening. Uh, what is happening is that CRA covers a very wide range of products. The previous speakers have only tackled the consumer products which are uh, in our day-to-day -day life. But as some other people were putting it, CRA covers from connected toothbrushes up to equipment which will be used in a nuclear power plant. So you have to understand that the measures need to be tailored according to um, the level of criticality, according to the uses and um, according to the potential risks which we encounter. So uh, that being said, there is always a risk-based assessment there is an annex which will uh, provide, based on the risk assessment, measures that need to be taken by the manufacturers. But we all have to be um, practical and realize that cybersecurity is not something you do and then it's done. And there is no product which is 100% cybersecure according to the technology we have today. But um, vulnerabilities are being discovered, vulnerabilities need to be fixed. So this is what the CRA introduces, and um, this is what we are discussing uh, these days. The fact that um, every product has to be put on the market with a clear indication for how long this type of vulnerability patches will be deployed, how long the manufacturer has the obligation to maintain the product and to provide uh, security updates to the user. And there are three different positions from three different institutions. Um, commission pro uh, floated around a deadline of five years, uh, which was not applicable to everything. The parliament, in exchange, um, made a link between the lifetime of product and the support period where, uh, we, uh, where the manufacturer will have to provide uh, patches. Again, it's always a disclaimer, 100% cybersecurity is no, never going to be uh, achieved. But what is going to be achieved is that the moment when a consumer will buy a product, there will be an indication of the date until they will get support, of the date until the security patches will be issued and they will be available for probably, probably uh, even after. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the manufacturers have the obligation now to make a risk assessment and to comply with some requirements on cybersecurity. This is another big win, I would say. And when I say win, it's not because any of the three institutions wants some, a diverging aspect. I think the divergences are more in the details, but the main, the core of the CRA, the core of the commission proposal was anyway very good. It was a welcomed step that was missing. So we have information for consumers, we have obligations for manufacturers, and we have the obligation to remedy whenever the problems are being discovered. Up to, on top of those, we have the market surveillance authorities, which like for any other product, will have to ensure that products put on the market do comply with the regulations and security uh, is ensured. 
I would say that all these statements are quite high level because as one of the previous speakers said, we don't have many security standards. We are still in a void and this is no longer a legislative void. It's a technical void. We need to choose in the future how much security is needed and how much security it's okay to be inserted before the consumer product becomes consumer unfriendly. But that's not the scope of the CRA. Um, on where we are and what we do, we are discussing. As I was describing the, the legal procedure, the three institutions are meeting regularly quite a lot. Um, there is a huge effort from the teams of all three institutions. Um, and soon there will be one political meeting where maybe uh, steps forward will be taken. The expected uh, deadline to close this file is this year under the Spanish presidency, uh, which means that with a bit of luck, um, it will be published uh, early next year. That would be my general presentation, but looking forward for your questions if there. are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian, for uh, such an interesting presentation that was indeed very enlightening and uh, I'm sure very useful for our listeners uh, on the particular procedure that is uh, undergoing uh, on this very important file. And uh, on that, I'll like start to start opening the beer for, for questions and maybe as a a uh, bit of a trigger. I'll uh, I'll go first. I will before I'll just remind our our listeners uh, on on the other side of the line that uh, they can also uh, take the floor. Should you wish to um, place any questions, you can just click on the little uh, bubble balloon button on the right hand side, and you can type your question directly. Uh, or an alternative, you can also ask for the floor. Um, and we'll be happy to, to take your questions as well. Uh, but for now, I'd like to ask, uh, maybe come back to the, the beginning um, uh, on this very important point, uh, which is uh, the issue for how long these products are, are kept. Uh, as we understand, this is also one of the key points that is uh, currently being discussed, is uh, that it's not just about for how long, for just how, how much secure these products are when they're placed on the market, but it's also for how long do they uh, remain secure. Um, uh, and going back to Andrew, I see that which has done a lot of work precisely on the issue of how um, premature obsolescence can come to be. You've uh, elaborated a bit on that. Um, uh, from your position, how important is it that, uh, um, and, and also to Wells' extent, Indeed, to all, I think we can all have the we can all have a, a go at this. Uh, how important is it for you that indeed uh, this protection, the cybersecurity protection, that these requirements should be applied, um, not just for a few years, but uh, indeed for for as long as these products are 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 in use? Um, do you see a particular issue with, with premature obsolescence uh, on this issue, um, and why is it so important? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's vital, really. I mean, like, you look at a lot of the things that are affecting uh, businesses, ransomware, big tax. Often these things come through unpatched systems, systems that are, haven't been updated, haven't been taken on. Now, at the moment, there isn't the, the prize for the criminals <clears throat> as such with the home market. You know, it, they haven't quite worked it out, but they'll get there. And the more unpatched legacy kit that is in people's homes, the bigger the risk. It doesn't mean they're going to get hacked, but it means that there's more of a risk profile to them. But also equally, um, you know, you take, you take a washing machine, for example. You know, so, you know, we've, we've seen washing machine update policies that are published. A lot of them say nothing, but uh, a, a couple of years. So a couple of years from launch, we will we will support your product. Now, based on our data, an estimated lifetime for a washing machine is 11 years, right? So, you know, even the really good policies are not even quite getting to, to, to the lifetime of, a, of an appliance. And I think we, what we really need to remember is these appliances are not smartphones. They're not built on a smartphone model of upgrade within two to three years. They're not, they just don't, they don't work like that. And they shouldn't because of sheer size of materials and also um, the fact that they're installing people's homes. They're, 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 you know, they're relied on in different ways. So it's absolutely vital the, the by force or by market forces, um, com companies are, 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 are forced or pushed to take more responsibility to the full life cycle of their smart products because that really hasn't happened to date.
many thanks. Uh, Els, would you like to join in as, as well? Yes, and indeed, this is the point actually where cybersecurity meets consumers' expectations, but also early obsolescence. I mean, uh, many of the tested products and many of the things that popped up in the hackable home, actually, they're, they're good to be used as long as they receive software updates. So basically, the manufacturer holds the cards in hands, uh, not only for your cybersecurity, but also about the lifespan of, of products. And, and we know consumers are frustrated with, you know, products not, not lasting long enough. They want to use their devices longer. And some of them also hold on them, uh, hold on to them very much longer. Um, the expensive ones, but also the other ones. I mean, the example of, of, of the washing machine is a really striking one. I mean, imagine throwing away a washing machine after five years, but if, you know, a manufacturer stops the updates, he's basically saying throw them away, which is not only detrimental to consumers, but also devastating for the environment. Uh, so it's absolutely key that um, we work on, on, on you know, securing uh, these devices for the long run. That's a very important point. Uh, on that question, I'd like to ask you, um, we've seen that Parliament has had um, uh, an approach as detached a bit from, uh, as departed a bit from what the Commission has proposed. The Commission has spoke about protecting these products for their expected uh, lifespan. We've had uh, Parliament proposing a different support period. In your opinion, what would be the best way of tackling this issue of ensuring that uh, products aren't just made secure, but also remain secure uh, for as long as, the, as they indeed should? <clears throat> well, um... As I said, I'm working for the Greens, so I completely resonate with the arguments on plan obsolescence and uh, also the right to repair some things uh, also comes into play in cybersecurity because you need to give the repair people access to, to the code if it is uh, the case. So uh, definitely it was our long uh, fight to, to reach this point. Uh, but today, um, speaking exactly about uh, the lifetime and the support period, I mean, definitely the market forces will uh, push the manufacturers to provide patches or updates for a longer period because security, it's a competitive advantage in some cases. Um, the price, it should not matter. In the end, uh, cheaper or more expensive products, we need to have the same level of security and equivalent uh, probably uh, lifetimes. But the CRA doesn't deal with lifetime. So this is why the parliament has changed this uh, part um, and spoke about the support period because um, it was a feeling that we are regulating lifetime while there is a different regulation which will do that. So we connected the uh, support period to the lifetime of the product. It's proportionate. It's it needs to be clear that it's still the manufacturer deciding. So it's still going to be the market forces pushing for a shorter or a longer uh, lifetime with some help from the legislators. But in terms of cybersecurity, then we say that the support period should be proportionate to the expected product lifetime, but then in line with the nature of the product, user expectation, uh, availability of the over operating environment, um, because there are several factors that need to be taken into account. As I said, CRA covers a lot of products. That means that uh, maybe for a toothbrush, you have a one year expected uh, lifetime because afterwards the mechanical parts will no longer uh, provide the same level of functionalities, uh, while other products as washing machines, connected washing machines, uh, have a longer lifetime. So this is why setting a clear number for how long that support period was not um, favored in the parliament. So what we tried to do is to create the link between the lifetime, create the link between market realities and ensure that the users or consumers are informed in advance when they buy the product, what would be the expected support period. Is this the good, the best way forward? Um, I would say that covering so many topics, probably this is the way forward. Thank you. Many thanks. And on that, I'd like to um, perhaps jump in on that precise point. Um, and I think this question goes to all three. Uh, what do you think precisely of those kind of arguments that opponents of this legislation have so far made? You mentioned the industry, the industry push. Um, 
And we've heard some arguments that are basically saying that um, the CRA going with this horizontal legislation is going too far uh, to overregulate, and that providing, you know, in some cases, lifetime support um, for products in line with consumer expectations is, and I quote in a particular case, impossible to, to deliver. What is your reaction uh, to that? Is it impossible? Well, um, if I may, um, I would say it's not impossible because the criteria that the parliament is putting in the text, in fact, are used to determine the support period. So uh, they are not exact. It's not an exact science. Uh, it will require a lot of data. It will require a lot of monitoring. Uh, it will require a lot of analysis. And based on that, we can take educated uh, decisions. They will not be exact. Um, why wouldn't it be possible to provide support for the lifetime of a product? I would say it might be challenging if we speak about industrial devices, which have a 20 year long um, period. But in the same time, the parliament text says it should be proportionate. Um, it might be even longer because I think we need to be ambitious and realize that some products might last even longer than expected. So why not uh, save environmental costs and continue to use them? Um, I would say the impossibility needs to be uh, coming from certain stakeholders needs to be translated as the costs are too big and then uh, the economic efficiency of that product will be uh, reduced for the manufacturer. Undeniable compliance always brings a cost. So we in the parliament try to balance a bit um, the stick and the carrot, um, trying to provide to the small and micro enterprises and even medium ones um, certain leeway, uh, but in the same time making sure that consumers are not harmed by that. Um, the priority should be to find the balance, um, ensure fundamental rights are not impacted. There, there is no balancing that. Uh, ensure that the consumer's expectations uh, and the value for consumer is not touched. And in the same time that we do have um, an economic system which, provi uh, which provides for um, equipment manufacturers in Europe to thrive and provide better products for the consumers. Thank you. Any thanks. As a follow-up on that, uh, yeah. Andrew Els, um, precisely what Christian has said, I mean, this issue, um, uh, this cost that, that is paid, and sometimes, it, uh, if not all times, is undoubtedly translated to to cost for the consumer, uh, for the environment. I mean, should we not ask more for manufacturers uh, as a result from this? Well, what is your take on this from a consumer perspective? Um, we can go, either one, we can go first. <laughs> Well, just to say, I, I fully agree with what Christian just said. I mean, everything is always impossible until you do it. Um, and it, it needs to be clear that safety and security, it's not a luxury. It should be a basic, basic fact. I mean, consumers, they rely, when they buy a product, they rely on it to be safe and and frankly, they have every right to, uh, whether it's, you know, an old school traditional uh, product or it's a connected one. So security shouldn't be seen as a burden it's it's just part of the deal and and it's really needed to also secure the future of iot and this brings me back also to you know the economic in, in incentive um not investing in security it might seem like a short-term win but believe me it will be just short term because in the long run it will backfire uh, consumers will lose trust and and we will lose the great potential of of iot so it's really important to to set some benchmarks on on, on security uh, also to create a level playing field because let's not forget there are uh, manufacturers who are taking it serious and who are doing it well um, and right now they are fa uh, facing unfair competition so we really need to have a market where it is you know we have a, a minimum threshold that everyone needs to um needs to respect but i know in the best case scenario it can be also become a, a, a source of competition where you go further uh, providing longer updates uh, to to make sure that you can hold on to your, your device for a longer time um so it's absolutely crucial that we work on these economic incentives as well Thanks, Andrew. Would like to jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure. I mean, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly, but I, and I, and I think you know we we have to be cautious about the 
um, cost argument as in it's, uh, it's it's hard and expensive to do these things and it would have to push it onto the consumer i think we, we with a do- with a dose of reality it's hard because they've made it hard you know if you rush products to market if you um chuck out smart devices with no real plan if you don't control your supply chains and you have no real uh, ability to patch out um because you know all the developers have left or you bought things off the peg or the company doesn't exist anymore uh, and they've got a no backup plan, then yeah, it is going to be hard. But that's because you haven't embedded good security principles in it in the first place. And a lot of this is trying to kind of encourage when producing smart products, them to be embedded with this with the same common sense frameworks that we might have in a safety context, although that's not always perfect either. But, you know, this is where we're trying to go. We're trying to shift the market to a much more responsible footing. And yes, there are companies doing it right. Uh, let's, let's, let's not be about the bush. There are some great companies out there they're doing some good stuff but a lot of the market really is still in a in a in a rush rush to rush to market mode with sort of fairly ill thought out smart products with very limited security understandings and yes it's hard for them but you know i'm afraid my heart doesn't really bleed in that case <laughs> that's a very good point uh, speaking of, of of bleeding hearts um or maybe not uh, uh i would like to ask you Maybe on another point, which is um, something that has already been touched by uh, by you, by all three of you, um, especially by Christian, the idea that indeed we have a very, very broad scope, a very, very different kind of devices, and uh, different degrees of, of risk. Uh, and one of the of the issues that have always been brought up, also from a consumer perspective, is the idea that products of higher risk should undergo uh, stricter requirements. Um, so there's been a a uh, whole discussion about um, the infamous Annex 3, so the list of uh, critical devices, the ones that should require uh, far more interesting, far more um, strict conformity procedures. Um, and from a consumer perspective, a bit of a shock that not a lot of these consumer products that both you, Andrew, and, uh, and you, Els, have, have mentioned uh, have been considered. Uh, I would just like to know, what what is your take on that? And... Uh, how do you see the feasibility um, that, um, and, and the necessity of these particular products, uh, consumer products, to be seen? Just so much connected toys, smart door alarm systems, security systems. Uh, how do you see the necessity of these particular ones to require stricter conformity? Well, if I may, um, <laughs> well, um, if you have a look at, at the proposal, 90% of products would be considered as low risk, which means that they wouldn't need third party assessment and that it would be up to the manufacturers to self assess the compliance uh, with the rules and the requirements. This basically includes all consumer IoT. So every example that I have mentioned, every result that popped up in the hackable home test would be covered by this 90%. I mean, I think we have shown that there is nothing low risk about consumer uh, IoT. The consequences of a lack of security are very real, very tangible, and they can be very detrimental, not only for the consumers, because they can be hacked and they can be uh, exposed to to danger, uh, but it's also a way to launch a wider network attack. So there's nothing... You know, there's nothing low risk about insecure uh, consumer IoT. Let's take the example of, you know, a very basic product like a vacuum cleaner, a robot vacuum cleaner. You would think, what could be wrong with a robot vacuum cleaner? Well, we actually found one in our test that was not only cleaning the room, but also sharing your location, mapping the room where uh, it was vacuuming and and sharing the password of the Wi-Fi to, to which it was connected. And then you have door locks that can be easily overtaken so strangers can get in. Um, I mean, it really shows also, you know, having the experience with some of the manufacturers that we have contacted after the tests um, and the lack of responsiveness there, I think that absolutely more needs to be done uh, than just a self-assessment and that also consumer IoT should be considered for third-party assessment. Many thanks, Els. Uh, on, on that, Chris, I'd like to ask you, uh, uh, how do you see the feasibility of this uh, looking at the discussions uh, so far? I mean, is the uh, is this strict conformity assessment procedure, perhaps, you know, third-party assessment has been called for 
by Belk um, a possibility or does it still remain a bridge too far? Um, it's the bridge is further than far. The parliament mandate did include security devices like smart door locks, cameras, alarm systems, smart toys, uh, home automation systems. So we have listened to the consumer voice. Um, however, you you present the third party assessment as the uh, silver bullet that will fix everything. I would say it's a more nuanced um, while we will definitely push for that, um, I cannot forecast what will be the, the final result. Um, but even a self-assessment by the manufacturer, let's think about the electricity. It's true that cybersecurity seems a very complex issue, but the CRA puts cybersecurity and safety in the same C mark. Um, you don't need a third-party assessment to determine if a product, uh, it's, if a lamp, is going to electrocute the consumer or not. So sometimes a simple declaration is enough just because the declaration certifies that you went through the risk assessment, you have ticked the boxes from Annex 1, and from now on you are uh, under the control of the market surveillance authorities which can take measures and demand to you to put the product into conformity. So there are obligations. It's true, this still allows the market penetration of products which are not secure unless the uh, manufacturer has done a proper job. So let's admit um, errors or cutting corners might still happen. Um, third party assessment, it's a very cumbersome procedure for everybody. It's a costly procedure. Um, and especially when we speak about consumer devices, we speak about probably millions of types of products and most of them are now moving into being connected. Everything in a house will be connected. As long as it has electricity, probably will have a internet connection, which is a huge problem. It's a huge problem. I would say the CRA didn't even try to tackle that IoT problem. It tried to tackle the infrastructure, the backbone, which will transport data. So the networks are resilient, but it was less focus in the original proposal on the consumer devices. We as parliament, we tried to put them in and we will fight to keep them in. What the, res the final result will be, I cannot forecast. Thank you. Many thanks. And what seemed a bridge too far for us is a bridge at which you have just arrived, which is the, um, the end of our, um, of our discussion. Uh, with the permission of our speakers, we'll just stretch it a, a uh, instead of 45, we'll stretch it to 50, just to allow you to wrap up the discussion. I think it's been a very interesting discussion so far, so uh, I don't think that will be too much of a, of a hassle for you, I hope. Uh, so just to conclude, um, first of all, thank you so much for this interesting discussion, really. Uh, so perhaps just a telegraphic response uh, from the three of you, perhaps going back to the, uh, to the initial order, uh, starting with Andrew. So... Um, uh, one minute, 30 seconds, if possible. In your opinion, uh, does this proposal go then uh, the full mile to, to protect consumers? Um, and if you can go even more synthetic on it, uh, what is missing from it, uh, you think, to actually deliver that? Starting with Andrew. Uh, well, I'll probably give a slight politician's answer that any regulation is better than no regulation. Um, I think, you know, a lot of these things are... Um, uh, fairly low benchmarks now with, with a view to scale. I certainly know the UK legislation is is sort of being set up as a bit of a vehicle for future strengthening. You know, maybe one day we will actually make it mandatory that the Etsy standards, uh, a strengthened Etsy standard is, is has to be required for confirmation. Um, I don't know whether we're quite there yet. Um, but I, I think, you know, these these these, these, these rules and these, these, these situations are, are good but without market clarity, there are, there are limited chance for them to to really vest, you know. And, and I think we just talked about risk there. You know, we've we've had electrical safety legislation in place in many different areas for you know 20, 30 years, more, maybe probably more. So it's pretty clear what's a safe plug and what's not a safe plug. And in cybersecurity of circulated products, we still have a lot of interpretation of what is and isn't. So if you're relying on manufacturers to um, effectively self-certify, which I think you you know you do have to at some descriptions. Then 
you have to be absolutely clear to those people what is and isn't acceptable, you know, and that means guidance, that means clear market clarity, and that means strong regulators, um, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, that also goes down to the information that you're passing on to the consumer, um, you know, anything that says about software updates, anything that says about lengths of updates has to be really clear and unequivocal about what a commitment is, because any open for interpretation, and I think the market will, will ride a cart and horses through it. Um, so, you know, I don't necessarily want to get into like what is and isn't deficient in the legislation, but I think in terms of the two things, baseline regulation is better than nothing, but it has to be clear and unequivocal and backed by a serious system and, and market regulation system in place for it to really take hold and bite. Many thanks, Andrew. Uh, else? Oh, are we there yet? Almost, I would say, but not yet. Um, uh, based on the experience with the hackable home test, um, next to, of course, having a proper enforcement, which is absolutely crucial for any kind of regulation. It's really important for us to have, you know, um, having these devices covered for the long run. So the software updates and, and the messages we got here were really uh, hopeful. Uh, but also when it comes to consumer IO2, to, to really consider them not always as, as low risk. I, I've, 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 uh, I've heard that the bridge might be too far, but maybe uh, some might still throw us a rope. Indeed, a, a bridge too far or a bridge you been to reach. Uh, Christian. <laughs> To close, well, um, I completely agree that having regulation is better than no regulation. But I think we in the parliament were a, a bit more ambitious, and we want a good regulation. Is it going to be a perfect regulation? No, um, because it's the first of its kind. I mean, even if I made parallel with a safety one, um, I think we speak about a much more complex system. So, I think there are good signs. I think there will be a good result. Um, it could be great. But let's see. Thank you. Let's see indeed. And thank you so much. I guess uh, we will see by the end of the year. So stay tuned for the developments on the Cyber Resilience Act uh, uh, to see if we manage to reach that bridge after all or not. Uh, from our side, it has been an absolute pleasure to have this discussion. Thank you so much to Andy, Els, and Christian for such an insightful discussion. It's been uh, truly a pleasure. Uh, I hope our listeners uh, at home or at the office have had a, also a great time and uh, have gotten away with a lot more insight on this particular proposal, the Cyber Resilience Act and uh, the cybersecurity landscape today as a whole and what we need to do to tackle, as Christian put it, the Wild West. Uh, so uh, from our side, that is it. We've reached the end. Thank you so much for um, passing this afternoon with us. Thank you so much for listening and uh, looking forward to further discussions uh, from our side. In the meantime, please do follow uh, Bilk's uh, tw former Twitter, now X uh, account. Uh, the recording will be made available also on this link so you can catch up on any particular moment you'd like. Best moments always available here and uh, do follow us on social media. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thank you.